Thank you. Uh, all right, so chain rule, that's, that's where we stopped two days ago. Today I just have the examples, even though some of them quite heavy examples, but they, they considered as a canonical examples and you're supposed to know them. So one example we looked at last time, so I just brought this slide to give you the, again the, the theorem what the chain rule is. Remember, on the formal side, on the theorem side, chain rule is basically this multiplication as it is with the one-dimensional functions. You multiply the derivative of the outer function by the derivative of the inner function. It's as simple as this. This trickiness of the actual rule, I mean, to those of you who try the chain rule in practice, you know that okay, some of you do this tree diagram, some of, some of you just remember this uh, verbally the way we do it. All of this is hidden by this cross, by this matrix multiplication. So formally, just one single multiplication. But in, in practice, when you start implementing this, this is the matrix multiplication which, brought about the, which brings about this complex tree-like procedure you need to follow if you want to apply the chain rule for the function of multiple variables. I showed you one example where this is the case. Yeah, it was one of, one of the examples of Jonathan Kress, here, here it is. That's the one which we did with you. It's when we had this function gxy, which is simple xy square product. And x and y in its, uh, in its, uh, by themselves, we treat them as a function of, of r theta with a polar substitution. And we needed to find this g uh, derivative g by r. Like I said, you can do it directly by just direct, sub direct substitution and do a direct computation. Or you can follow the chain rule. This tricky formula is here, color-coded. So you basically read it like this. You take derivative of g with respect to its first own argument, or g, g function. It has its own arguments, x and y. And I call them own arguments of the function g. So you take g by its first own argument, and then the function of the first own argument by r, and then g by the second one, and y, and the second one by r. And then you make substitutions. Here they are g by x is y square, substitute, well, substituted. x by r is cos theta, g by, g by y, the red one here, it's double xy, right in here, sine theta, the same, eventually, we end up with the same expression as with the direct computation. Yeah. So this formula, which is color-coded, here's a link of this formula with this simple matrix multiplication. Here it is. You think of your polar substitution as a function f, which takes R2 to R2. That's the function. The, different, uh, the Jacobian, which is associated with that map or that function, here it is. It's two, two by two matrix. The Jacobian of G matrix, or the gradient in this case, because only one row matrix, is like so. So when you do your matrix multiplication, as it is uh, instructed by the, by the main chain rule theorem, that's the matrix multiplication here, when you do this multiplication, you end up with this Tricky tree-like procedure. As I said, as I said before, every time you can trace it back to matrix multiplication. Here's another example. So here's my function z of x and y. So x and y own arguments of z. X and y in itself, they are functions of t. See, that's that's the that's the explicit value for x and y. We need to find z by dt with when t equals zero. Again, you can do it directly. You can directly sub in cos t here in x position, sine t here in y position. If you do that, you will end up with a function of one variable, just explicit formula for that function, and you can find a derivative. It will be just a first-year approach to the same problem. Or you can do it via chain rule. On this slide, there is no anymore the direct approach present, but you can do it on your own and double check with the chain rule approach. The chain rule approach is here. Again, this tricky formula, you see, z by x by its own argument, and then x by t, plus z by y by the second own argument, and y by t. Interestingly enough, the thing which you have to pay attention to, the use of the letter d here. Here you see sometimes the upright d is used, sometimes the curly d is used. This is a reflection of the fact that z, after you treat the function uh, z as a function of t, it's a function of one variable. That's why the upright d is used here. And that's why the upright d is used here for the x, because function is also a function, uh, sorry, because x is also a function of one variable. It's a notational differences, but sometimes people may, well, people pay attention to that, especially when they mark your 
writings. And then this is just a computation again. So z by x from here, it's double x e x squared plus y, and then x by t right in here in brackets. Then z by y, it's just exponential, nothing else. And the y by t is this cos right in here. That's the computation. Well, as a matter of fact, you need to find the derivative only at the point t equals 0. So at this point t equals 0, x function takes the value 1, right? Cos of 0 is 1. y takes the value 0. Sine of 0 is 0. So you use these new values together with the value t equals 0 across this expression. <coughs> as a matter of fact, uh, in this approach, the direct computation would be harder to do, especially given that t equals, no, probably hard is a, is a big word here. There's nothing is hard on this, uh, in this sort of simple example. But still, it will be a little bit length, more, uh, sorry, a little bit lengthier than the chain rule approach. I think so. Maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, this, this, that's a substitution of t equals 0, x1, y equals 0 across this expression, and the result is e. Well, the next slide actually just explains again the reason why we have such a chain rule expression. It's again traced back to matrix multiplication. Look at this. This time, f is a function of r2 to r in a... Should be the other way around, actually. I'll just flip back to my previous slide. Yeah, it should be the other way. Yeah, it should be the other way around, actually. It's a type on the slide. Because before, g was the outer function, and f was the inner function. Here, they just swap. I mean, the, the roles of the functions swapped. The inner functions here is g. The outer function here is f. Right? Look look back at the slide. The, this is a z, for z function. So exponential is the outer function. And in the theorem, and my in the first example, g the symbol, the symbol g was the one which we used for the outer function. Here, there's just, well, obviously, just this is the omission of the person who put the slide together and the person who get this ready for, for this lecture. Yeah, you see, I'm sharing it. <laughs> anyway, if you just make this correction, that this time f is the outer function and g is the inner function, the rest just goes in the same, in the, in, uh, according to the same rule. Uh, the Jacobian of f is this one. One row, two columns, it's just a gradient. Jacobian of G function, it's the two rows, one column, here it is. And the derivative of, of, the, of the composition, F circle G, it's the matrix product of two derivatives in the right order. Outer function, F this time, and the inner function. And when you multiply matrices of this shape, they are of compatible, uh, compatible sizing. The result will be just one numerical, one number, like this. Yeah. And that's the explanation for the formula we used on the slide before. After, uh, after a while, of course, you will just use the formulas directly. You don't need to make this link to the matrix all the time. Uh, but for a few times, I encourage you to do that. There are a few questions. There will be a few questions in total set where you need to do this linking with the matrix version of the chain rule formula. Do, uh, you have to do it because it's a part of the question. Uh, some other times you don't need to do it, but still I encourage you to do this, to do this linking with the matrices. It's, it's, it shows you the structure of the chain, of the, of the chain rule. Yeah. Well, this is just a, the version of the chain rule which happens when you have, look what happens here. When f depends on x, y, z, and w, so f depends on four, it's all, oh, sorry, four own arguments, and these own arguments, x, y, z, w, they, in, this, uh, in their turn, they depend on the other r, s, and t. In such a circumstances, in such circumstances, sorry, the, your, your, the formulae for the derivatives, they will take this rather long and horrible look. But if you trace it back to the matrix, matrix version of it, it again will be simple matrix multiplication. That's the beauty of this matrix way of expressing things in relation to the chain, especially when you try to prove something about that. If you try to, to prove something about, if you try to prove something using this horrible formula, it's, it's, it becomes difficult because it's just to, to write this up becomes difficult. Whereas 
if you use the matrix way to write things, it's just a product of two matrices all the time, A and B, or G of G and F. Yeah. All right, there's another example from the Jonathan Cress set of examples. Uh, this is a kind of examples you will see a few times in the tutorial set where you have to check that the particular function is a subject to a given differential equation. So look what happens here. You'll hit, you'll, like I said, you'll, you'll see a few examples of this type in the, in the tutorial set. So here we have a function of one variable, numerical function, r to r, and another function, f capital, given as a combination of this g and something inside. So it's a clear case for a chain rule, even though it's a simple case for a chain rule, because g function is one to one. I mean, it's a numerical function. Uh, the, what we have to show is that, that the function f, capital F, it's a solution to, to this PD. PD, it stands for the partial differential equation. It's a very straightforward computational example. We need to compute two partial derivatives using the chain rule, obviously. We have to sub this into the left-hand side of my differential equation, and we have to make sure that the result is zero. Well, everything, everything is done on this slide. There will be a few questions like that in the tutorial, so look at this. Well, in this presentation, actually, because, because we discussed chain rule, uh, this slide actually makes it even clearer that the, this is the case for the chain rule. So we introduce this auxiliary function h of two variables x and y, and then make my f capital look like a composition, g circle h, you see? So that's the case for the chain rule. Here it is. So if I want to see the Jacobian of my f map, which is the 1 by 2 matrix, Right? One row, two columns, numerical function of two arguments. That's why one row, two columns. That will be the product of the G and the product of the H Jacobians. Here they are spelled out. So the G Jacobian, G is a, just a function of one variable. Jacobian for that function just a derivative. So it's a matrix one by one. So basically it's a number. And the Jacobian for H is another gradient vector. So oh, that's the computation finished. So yeah, if you use this value, so for the first component of this vector, it's the first component of this vector. So it's a g, uh, g dash 3x take 4y square and this free, one component only. Uh, the second uh, d, df by dy, it's the second component of that of this of this vector, which is again g dash and this neg negative. 8y. Okay. And then you just sub it in here, and that will be true. I mean, that will satisfy the equation. So in, in this other question, it's just a direct computation. As long as, you, as long as you do the chain rule correctly, there shouldn't be any difficulties. Even though this time, doing the chain rule correctly, it may represent some challenges. Any questions? No? Yes? I have another three examples of a chain rule, which are a little bit harder than this. I mean, they're a little bit more involved. Uh, these are, will also be in the tutorials, or sim these, actually, these exactly questions, they will be in the tutorial for you to just practice again, plus they will be similar ones. Uh, these are these two, these three examples, they are on the, on the other side of slides, on the dynamic slides. I'll take you there. It's about polar substitution again. We did one question with polar substitution today, actually, on one of the examples, the first example I showed today, and the one which I started discussing two, two days ago. There was a polar substitution there. The difference in this example, this time, the, the outer function in the first example, the, it was a very explicit function, was x times y squared. Whereas here, the outer function is just, just a symbol. So this time, you don't have this luxury of direct approach, because the outer function is just a symbol, f of x, y. 
That's why the only way to do it is via chain rule. The other complication in this example, it's the other way around. In that example, in the first example, we found R and theta derivatives in terms of x and y derivatives. Whereas here, I, do it, I want to do it the other way around. I want to find x and y derivatives in terms of R and theta. Let me just bring that example again just to, just to convince you that I'm not lying to you. Look at this example. This first example on this set of slides here. Well, too much. Yeah, you see? The same polar substitution. Outer function this time is given by the explicit formula. And we need to find outer function by R, which we done in terms of here, which we done in terms of outer function by X and by Y. That's the chain rule directly applied. Now I want the other way around. I want X and Y derivatives in terms of R and theta derivatives. There are two ways to do it. And I'll show you, I mean, they're almost identical. And they rely a little bit on the first year stuff we, you, you know from, I mean, linear algebra stuff. Look at this. So if I use a chain rule, as before, and I use it in a, in a forward way, so I express my R derivative in terms of X and Y derivative, you see? So I, I say that FR derivative, it's the F with respect to the first own argument, then X by R, then F with respect to the second own argument, and then y by r. And that's how it is if we replace the xr and x and y r derivatives from here and from here. This is in line with the first example today. Theta derivative, again, in terms of x and y. So, so far I do the other way around. I express these two in terms of these two. It's a chain rule, it's a chain rule again f by x by the first own argument, then x by theta, then f by y, second own argument, and then y by theta, and then again substitution for the x theta and y theta derivatives. Again, directly from the polar. Directly from the polar. Now, we need the other way around. At this stage, if you're facing a problem like that, what do you think will be the good, good approach? What would, be, what would be a second good step to finish the question? The question says find x, fx and fy in terms of fr and fr, f theta, and we did the other, the, we did just the opposite, opposite thing. What would you suggest at this, in this late hour? Any suggestions? Any suggestion? Will do, I mean, any, any possible suggestion? Any wild guesses? Yes? Use the inverse function. Inverse function. Can we just well, I understand every word you said, but, <laughs> but I didn't understand the strategy. Can you just elaborate a little bit? But what you, you you had something in the, in the back of your head, right? And I, I didn't get the message actually. Well, how how can we possibly use an inverse function here? I guess. You get. <laughs> can you solve solve this too? Like solve for what? For dash. And if if I what, how how do, what does it look like similar to something you used to do a lot, or not? What what you used to do a lot? Solve what? Hey. Eh? One of you, please. Just go, go ahead. So you want to say that we're looking actually, in terms of fx and fy, we're looking at two linear equations with two unknowns. And we know how to solve that, right? How, how do we solve that? Yeah, I know. How do we solve? What's the method? <laughs> Don't we have like a special beautiful name for that, which you've been like a hammered, the, the name was hammered in your heads like for the first, for the back substitution. Maybe Gaussian elimination, right? Maybe row echelon forms, all of these beautiful things, right? Yes, but actually I'll surprise you, I'll do it differently. 
but you in principle you are we just solve for one and for f of x and f of y just I, i'll choose a slightly different method of solving for this because it's i don't know it's in, in this in these circumstances it's probably the better one we can solve for x y and f y but i'm going to use kramer's rule do you remember the kramer's rule <laughs> you don't what is it what is it no, no, you know it by this name. <laughs> I mean, if you if you know it, you know it certainly by this name. I'll give you 100% guarantee. If you know it, you know it by this name. Uh, it's the way to come up with the solutions. That, I mean, it's a direct formula for the solution. We all know, I mean, you're quite experienced with this business, with this system of linear equations, that it's not always true that system is solvable. And it's, it is not always true that the system is actually uniquely solvable, right? We all know that there was a the whole bunch of theorems which test all different criteria when the system is solvable, when it's uniquely solvable, row echelon forms, uh, pivots, leading, non-leading columns. Kramer's rule, it's sort of like a sh shorter way to analyze system. It, it doesn't give you the complete analysis. It only just solves the system in case the system has a unique solution, which I'm hoping it is the case in this case. Uh, and it just uses the determinants to find that. So basically, you compute the prime, uh, the principal determinant of the system, which is the com just you combine all of these coefficients, like an augmented matrix, but without the right hand side. You combine them in a determinant, like this. You you should know this method. When when I was teaching the first year, we we discussed this. So you combine these coefficients of your system of linear equation. And it's okay. If, I guess it's a very, very simple one. You compute this determinant. If this determinant is non-zero, the system has a unique solution. In fact, it's even on the if result. Now, when the system has a unique solution, Kramer's rule also suggests the way the formula to this uh, for this unique solution. It says you now build two other determinants, delta one, like this. So where you replace the first column of the principal determinant by the well, I should call this the right-hand side, even though on my slide it's the left-hand side. But in official, in official, like in, a, in a strict language, in the system of linear equation universe, it's the right-hand side. You replace this first column with the right-hand side, and you compute the determinant. Then you compute the second determinant, where you replace the second column of the principal determinant with the right-hand side of your system of linear equations, and compute that. The Kramer's rule says, Kramer's rule says that the solution which we're looking for, fx and fy, is just the quotients of these two determinants, free well, delta one by delta, and delta two by delta. That's that's all there is for the for the for the Kramer's rule. So it says you compute the principal determinant. If it is non-zero, system has a unique solution. If it is not, then the system, then that's it. You have to use the Gaussian elimination, row echelon form, and all of this beautiful stuff. But if it is non-zero, it is a there is a one unique solution. And if you want to find this, that's how you find this. By quotients of these two determinants. It's a it's a perfect thing, right? You just have a direct formula for the solutions. If you don't like this, you can solve it any other way. I don't insist on you following the Kramer's rule. Like I said, you're very experienced with the system of linear equations. And I'm sure everyone here is capable of solving these two <coughs> systems on your own. And that's the end of it, right? We found fx and fy in terms of fr and f theta. F theta. So let me just say it again. This, these lines where I use the Kramer's rule for solution, if you, don't, if you hate the Kramer's rule all of a sudden, then you don't have to use it. You can solve it any other way. Any questions? Now, surprisingly, this wild guess which came from that side of the class about the inverse functions, we can make sense of it, <laughs> but that will be a different solution. For the same question, I'm going to present a different solution, and I have some reasons for that. I'll show you these reasons later. But for now, I'm going to do the same thing, but with a different 
different approach with the inverse functions. And Alex, now I'll, I'll show some so what I mean by that. Remember the, these answers. We're going to come up with the same answers, but now differently. So if you're done with this slide, I, I want to switch to another slide. I'll just switch to another slide. Ah, you're going to kill me now. So look at the same question. Uh, that's right. So <clears throat> I'm going to use the chain rule again. But I'm going to use the chain rule now in the opposite direction straight away. So before, before, in my previous solution, remember what I said? I said the FR derivative it's fx times xr plus fy times yr. Well, why can't we do it directly for the fx now? So if I want to if I want to see fxy in terms of fr theta, why don't I just say by the chain rule again that fx fx is the derivative of fr times r by x? So you see, I'm doing the chain rule in the opposite direction straight away, and then plus f theta times theta or x, like this. That's a chain rule. And the same line for the f y derivative. You don't have this the other slide in front of you right now, but you took notes, and I'll, I'll make my uploads, even though I'm a little behind on, behind on the uploads right now, but eventually that I'll make my uploads. Put these two slides together next to each other and see the difference. Oh, I, I, I can, yeah, well, you have your notes. You can compare that. Basically, we almost finished the question, right? Look at this, fx and fy, straight through fr and f theta, fr and f theta. But we almost finished the question. We almost actually takes significant time to be, to be removed from this sentence. Because this rx and theta x is something we no longer can strictly uh, directly see from here. Before, it was x by r and x by theta, which comes, I mean, it's a direct computation of the derivative. This time, it is not. How can you see r by x from here? Solved it. How do you solve it? <laughs> okay, and? Yeah, but theta also depends on x, right? You will end up with the chain rule, sort of. Like, I mean, yes, you can divide x by cos. You will differentiate by x. It will be like a quotient rule, right? The determinant will be simple. It's x by x is 1. But the, the uh, denominator will be cos theta, which is not a constant, right? It depends on, on, on x. Yes, yes. Well, that's, 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 that's why I want to show you this slide. And the inverse functions, as you suggested, will be the, the, place, the way to do it. But it's a little bit different to the way you, you did the implicit differentiation in the first year. Look at this. So in principle, yes, you're correct. We can take these two identities, and we can solve for r and for theta. We can. Some of you can even find the explicit formulae for that solutions. But I'm not going to do that. So in principle, I can solve for r and for theta from these two lines. And if, if I finish this solution, I can take from here the derivative rx, ry, theta x, and theta y, which I'm missing to complete these two lines. So in principle, you can do that. Some of you may even finish this actually, I mean, finding this formula. But I'm not going to do that. Because I don't need to do that to find these missing factors here, these factors. Instead, I'm going to follow this implicit differentiation trick you did a few times in the first year. But this time, it will be implicit differentiation, which involves multiple arguments. And that's why it will be chain rule with multiple arguments. Look at this, look what I'm going to say. So you can call this the inverse polar map, right? It just does the opposite. Mapping, look what I'm going to say. Uh, so imagine I have this inverse maps. If I put these maps in here and in here, in here and in here, I will end up with the correct numerical identities, right? So if I put them there, here it is. That will be correct numerical identity. See? You see, I replace my R with this 
imagine, well, it's not ima I want to say imaginary solution, but it has nothing to do with the complex numbers, of course. It's a solution which we don't have, but which, in principle, we may have it. With some effort, we can discover that solution. Right? And this triple lines just means it's true for every x and y. And what I'm going to do now, I'm going to differentiate these two lines four times. Twice for, for x and twice for y. So here it is. If I apply x differentiation, first line, second line, look what happens. x differentiation here is just 1. x differentiation here is Rx, this one we're looking for. Well, this is a product rule, right? We have to use the product rule and the chain rule at the same time. So Rx times cos, then goes R, and then negative sign theta x. If I apply dx derivative for the second line here, 0 on the left-hand side, because y is independent of x, then here the product rule again, it's my rx, the one we're looking for, sine theta, r times cos theta, and theta x, that's another one we're looking for. At this stage, if I ask you, remember, we're looking for this rx and looking for this theta x, at this stage, if I ask you how to find them, you will tell me, what will you tell me? We can. So it's another system of linear equations with two unknowns. We can solve again. Well, given that we use the Kramer's rule on my on my slide before, and given that the principal determinant in this system, if you follow Kramer's rule again, will be identical to the principal determinant from the slide before, I'll use the Kramer's rule. If I solve this by Kramer's rule, the principal determinant is R. You see, I use the dot to hit these details which are present on the slide before. Principal determinant, cos, sine, r negative sine, r cos. So it, it is actually r. The other two determinants, delta 1 is just this one. Remember, to, delta 1 is the one where you replace the first column by the right-hand side. And again, I use the term right-hand side because uh, that's, that's in the system of linear equations universe. That's what we call the right-hand side. And delta 2, right in here. And so my Rx takes this form. And theta x takes this form. It's a quotient of delta 1 by delta for Rx. And the delta 2 by delta for theta x. Now the other two are, the, the other two factors we're looking for are uh, r by y and theta by y. They will come up from the similar procedure if I use the second differentiation by y. If I differentiate these two lines by y now, and I do this, look at this. So if I use my d by dy differentiation on the first line here, on the first line here it's zero on the left hand side because x is independent of y. That's the product tool and the chain rule together. Here's my two unknowns. We need it to finish this computation. And that's the second line where the y differential is applied. It's another two systems with two, un two systems, of, I'm sorry. It's another two linear equations with two unknowns, which we can solve. If you don't like Kramer's rule, you can solve any other way, but in these circumstances, the Kramer's rule is the best, the quickest way to solve this, especially because, you see, when you go for delta 1, delta 2, you sub in one zero column, which makes evaluation of the determinant is a thing which comes from the top of your head. So if I use the Kramer's, if I use the Kramer's here, Again, the principal determinant here, look at this. It's a product across this diagonal, right? Cos theta by r cos theta. It's r, sine, uh, it's r cos square theta. And plus r uh, sine square theta, just r. And two other determinants, they're like this. If you don't like Kramer's rule, you can solve it any other way. But I, if you don't have it in your, in your set of tools of solving of system of linear equations, you should add it there. Sometimes it save, saves lots of times. Yes, please. Uh, 
Yes, that's right. Thank you. It's a type. Yes, it is state of Y, of course. It's a Y derivative here. Thank you. Uh, and that's it. So you take the quotients, delta 1 by delta, that delivers your first unknown, Ry. You take the second quotient, delta 2 by delta, that's the second unknown, theta y. This is how you do implicit differentiation with the functions of multiple variables, with the maps, I'm sorry, of multiple variables. So not only the you have multiple variables, but the look back here. The values are also two-dimensional here. It's not an easy process. It's a, it requires you see lots of solutions of system of linear equations, but in principle, it's a doable process. And that allow, we see that that allow us to, uh, allowed us to find this Rx, Ry, theta Rx, theta Y without knowing these functions explicitly. These functions are not easy to present, as a matter of fact. I mean, uh, R function probably is all right because it's just x squared plus y squared under the square root. It's just the distance. But theta function, this theta function, it's a tricky one because it requires the arctan and you need to split this into quadrants. It's, it's not an easy function. You can try to solve this directly. It's like the formula for the argument of a complex number. It's not a simple formula. It's two state, like a two clauses formula with the different cases. So even if you solve this directly, finding that derivative, it's not easy. And part in, is, is it look, is, if you look at if you live into this, you, we don't need that. We don't need, we don't need to know the direct formula for these two. Well, now if you substitute what we found, if you substitute what we found into these two formulae, you will end up with the result we found on my other slide. And that will be the end of the solution. Second solution to the same question. Any questions? Hmm. Okay. Well, if you don't have any questions, I'd like to discuss with you second derivatives with the polar thing. So, uh, and that's actually why I did the second solution, because this knowledge we have just discovered, when the knowledge of this inverse der derivatives of the inverse functions, uh, the derivatives of the inverse polar map, so this map, which still we don't have the direct formula for, but we do know the derivatives of this inverse polar map. Here they are. All of them I discovered on this slide. I'm going to use them to find the second x and y derivatives in terms of second r and theta derivatives. Okay? And that's a tricky question. I mean, it's, it requires significant discipline when you exercise the chain rule, even if you know all of, I mean, yeah, if you, even if you know all of what we discovered. It requires significant discipline when you apply the chain rule. Uh, and what was the other thing? Never mind the other thing. Let's just look at this this example. Yeah. And that's the last example for today. So the same setting you see, we have a function. We have polar. We have polar substitution. And now I need my second derivatives, f double x, f double y, f mixed one. As a matter of fact, I only do double uh, the f double x and f double y. I didn't do the mixed one. In terms of the second order, second order polar derivatives, and this time we follow, we follow the second approach because now we have all of these uh, these auxiliary derivatives of the inverse polar map. It will be relatively easy to, I mean, as, soon, as long as you just are careful with the, with, the, with the way you apply the chain rule, it will be relatively easy to, to see what, to find the result. And the result itself, actually, it's interesting. I'm, I'll discuss the result itself later. So let's just do first, uh, let's just do the computations first. So that's what I said on my slide, computed earlier, and I opened what we computed earlier on my slide before. We computed with you that x and y derivative, they are, related to, to R and theta derivatives via these two formulae. That's what we discovered on slide before. We also discovered with you these derivatives of the inverse polar maps. Here they are. 
That's the information from the slide before. Four inverse polar maps we discovered. And that's a good thing to keep in mind. Lots of questions involve polar maps and inverse polar maps. So knowing these derivatives, it's a piece of a theory, as a matter of fact. That's the things which we have from the slide before. You see, I just made an effort and I expressed my inverse polar deriv der derivatives using x and y rather than theta and cos and sine, which makes it a bit shorter sometimes. Yeah. So f double x, this one, if I do f double x, I need to differentiate this by x once again. And if I do that, it will be product rule applied twice, right? Here it is. If I do double x, I do product rule, and I do chain rule at the same time, right? So these two terms, these two terms, this is the product rule applied here. I'm sorry, I said the chain rule. Chain rule hasn't been applied yet. I did product rule here, so x, that's right. First, I differentiate the first factor by x, right in here, and then I differentiate second factor by x, right in here. <coughs> Let me just, can I zoom in a little bit? Too much, probably. Yeah, like this. Right, now this x derivative, this x derivative, I can use the same line for this x derivative, that's the time for the chain rule. So when I compute this x derivative, look what I say, rx. When I do rx, this is double r and then r by x, and then r theta, and then theta by x, that's the chain rule. When I do this theta x, right here. When I do this theta x, it's another chain rule. Look at this. It's theta by r, second derivative by r, and then r by x. And then theta by theta, and theta by x. I'm going to sub this. I'm going to, I'm going to sub this expression right in here. And I'm going to sub this expression right in here. But before I do that, I need to make an effort and find this second second derivatives of the inverse polar maps. How do I do that? I take this and differentiate extra by x. If I take this and differentiate extra by x, so differentiate this piece by x, look what happens. R double x. This is a quotient rule. Or as a matter of fact, I like I like product rule more than the quotient rule. So it's a first, it's a it's a this expression, it's a derivative of the first factor, which is x, it's 1, by the second factor, 1 on r, and then x times the derivative of the second factor, 1 on r, which is negative 1 on r square, and then chain rule brings in another r of x factor. If for r of x I use this expression again, that's how it is. The second x, x derivative of the inverse polar map. This time it's easier, it's just a straightforward computation with the help of this. But that's how it is. Uh, theta double x, the same computation. I use this one and differentiate by x again. Y is a constant. We ignore that. This is 1 on r squared. It's a power function. So that's why it's 1 on r cube. Number 2 came up. And this is a chain rule. That's why r of x is present here as a factor. You have to analyze this carefully, all of this. It's, it's hard to pick it up maybe in just in one lecture just in class. So you have to take yourself through these computations once again in the, uh, with no time pressure uh, and everything. So that's what we found. Now we have everything for this one to do this expansion. And I do this expansion. And just a direct substitution. So I sub in here, the right-hand side from here, Rx squared. That's, the, that's, that's, all, that's all there is here. Uh, we can do a bit of a simpli simplification. We can combine. Look at this. F double R here. F double theta here. This F double theta. 
Um, the mixed one, R theta and theta R, we can just assume that they are identical. That's a Clorio theorem. That's why I double of this. And then the FR and the theta, I put them at the back, like this. That is the expression for the F double X. This is the expression for F double X. Now we have to make the similar effort for F double Y. I know it's, a, it's a close to six o'clock. We have four minutes left, but I hope you can survive. And now, I'll, well, now from the, because we already had some experience with F double X, we can do some little shortcuts. And like I said, if you are in a position to do something like this, it's a straightforward computation, but it requires discipline when you apply the chain rule, and it requires creativity when you design what you write and how you write this, how you group things, how you, what, what sort of steps you do. It's, it's, it's a skill to put the right formulae on the paper and skip the right formulae in order to deliver the message to the person who reads what you wrote. So let's just try F double Y. So F double Y comes from here. Mm. So it's a product rule in this term and the product rule in this term. For this and for, and for this, I need to use the chain rule once more. So I need to write up this four formulae, this four auxiliary preparation, preparation formula before I can replace this factor, this R double Y, this factor, and this theta double Y. I have this. And they, they go in, the, in line with this, with this four. Yeah, they go in line with this four. That's a chain rule to, when I compute this piece. Second by R, R by Y, second by theta, theta by Y. That's a chain rule when you compute this, when I compute this piece. Theta by R, theta by theta, and the factors. And then I need double Y and double, double Y from R, which comes from here. I apply Y derivative right from this, for this quotient. That's a quotient rule. Here it is. Well, quotient and the chain. And I apply double y to theta here, yeah. to theta y. Yeah. Now we're fully set. Even though that this time I will skip this long expansion stage, I can jump jump to something like this straight away because we can see through all we need. Like f r r will come up when you multiply this by extra r y. Is a term for r, uh, f double r. F double theta, as in here, will come up when you multiply this term by extra theta y. That's the second term. You see, I just jumping over a step, but because we we had some experience here, we can make this shortcut. Uh, mixed derivatives they come up. One of them come from here. One of them come from here. And every time it's uh, it's it's this fact. That's why it's double r y and theta y. And then goes the first order derivatives at the back. And that's the expression for F double Y. All right. One minute left, and we, we're almost done. So when I go for sum, F double X and F double Y, and that's the canonical notation for this sum. Some, sometimes it's called a Laplace. Well, in some books, the official, uh, the official name for this symbol is a Laplacian. Next time we're going to discuss this a little bit more. If I do the sum, look what happens. This F double R with this F double R. It delivers x square, sorry, rx square and ry square. If you look back at the expressions, it's a cos theta plus sine theta. It's just one. That's why f r r becomes just f r r r with this, with no any, with no any other factor. Uh, f double theta here and f double theta here. They come with a theta x square and theta y square. If you look back here, we have to add up these two factors. Right, squaring them before we add them up, it will be y square plus x square, which is r square. It will be r four at the bottom, so altogether it's r square, like this. Mixed terms they cancel each other. This mixed term cancels this mixed term. Mixed term. Look, at rx theta x, product of these two. 
is negative of product of these two, they cancel each other. FR, it's R double Y, which is, which is, where's my R double Y? I'm sorry, actually, I have to combine two. Uh, FR is this piece and this piece, and the coefficients next to it, next to it R double X and R double Y, from here, and, when my, and from here, if you combine these two together, again, y squared plus x squared is r squared. On this r cube, which is 1 on r. And this 1 on r and this 1 on r is double 1 on r. So all together, it's 1 on r. And f theta also cancels each other. If you just see f theta double y and theta double x, they're just one negative of the other. So the expression for this combination in polar coordinates takes this a little bit longer, but still simple, simple form. This has some implications for, for a few questions in applications. I will discuss it tomorrow. But for now, thank you very much for, for your patience. It was, thank you. Yeah, thank you. We're done. Thank you.